cold, quiet, and devoid of people. Places like this are often called ghost towns by the Japanese. Everything here has been frozen since March the 11th, 2011, the day a 9.0 Richter scale earthquake struck the ocean bed off the eastern coast of Japan. This earthquake was followed by a destructive tsunami over 10 meters high, which devastated homes and buildings along the coast. Over 20,000 people lost their lives or went missing. The power of the tsunami breached the walls surrounding the reactor area of the Fukushima nuclear power plant, creating a plume of dust and smoke. As reactor cores melted down, radioactive substances began to leak. Over 150,000 residents scrambled to evacuate the area. This is Tomioka, a town that lies within a 20-kilometer radius of the Fukushima nuclear power plant, an area which authorities have evacuated due to the spread of radioactive substances. This area is designated a no-go zone, where access is restricted due to safety concerns. As no one would be available for an interview here, we will try to convey the story through the scenes we capture. This clock has stopped ticking, and the calendar remains unchanged, marking the day, month, and year when the disaster struck. The work desks remain cluttered with documents, as though their owners just stepped out a moment ago, perhaps to run an errand or grab lunch before returning to work. Upon closer inspection, however, a thick, unblemished layer of dust covers everything without any fingerprints or signs of recent handling. An old motorcycle is parked at the side of the road, entangled in growing vines. Its position suggests that the owner abandoned it in some haste. Many cars in the showroom have remained unsold for so long that weeds have begun to invade. Even within this small shopping mall in the town, shoes and bags sit untouched on shelves. Fences line the roads and entrances to houses, barring unauthorized entry to restricted areas. We've been driving for over an hour within a 20-kilometer radius, passing numerous abandoned towns where time stopped on March the 11th, 2011. When we arrive at a small city called Minomisama, however, we finally glimpse signs of life. Even though it still looks desolate, with many shops still closed and the streets sparsely populated, there are still some people getting on with their lives. Japanese authorities lifted an evacuation order for the city in 2016, allowing more than 10,000 people, including children and pregnant women, to return. This was the largest number of people allowed back since the nuclear accident. Yuki is one of those who returned as soon as she could. She expresses a desire to revisit her shop, which has long been abandoned, even though she knows there might still be radioactive substances around. Being here, one must be cautious about the food consumed. The soil used for growing vegetables and fruit must be sourced from other cities. <laughs> Yuki mentioned that she plans to stay in the city for a while. Her relative, who's pregnant, or the children will however leave first, as they prefer not to stay any longer than necessary. The issue of radioactive contamination in the environment, whether in the water or soil here, means some people are justifiably reluctant to return. Following the lifting of the evacuation order, fewer than half of the residents have returned with the majority being elderly. Takahashi Kyuichi, the owner of a sushi restaurant in the city, states that he returned without bringing his children and grandchildren along. For him, 
The most important thing is to keep the children away from areas like this. He also says that adults can handle the situation. But children need to be particularly careful, especially about food. A city without children leaves many school buildings unused. The entire city is mostly populated by elderly people. After 6 p.m., darkness and silence envelop it. When the nuclear power plant blew up, the greatest concern was that radioactive substances might seep into the groundwater and eventually enter the food chain. Greenpeace has begun an undersea radiation survey to evaluate radioactive contamination emanating from the Fukushima nuclear power plant in the Pacific Ocean. A Japanese research vessel equipped with a remotely controlled vehicle containing gamma radiation measuring and sediment sampling instrumentation is deployed for this purpose. Greenpeace, five years after the start of the nuclear accident at Fukushima Daiichi, is here with the Rainbow Warrior and a Japanese research vessel to investigate the marine impacts of that accident. Greenpeace will be undertaking an underwater survey of the seabed, in the first instance within the 20 kilometer radius of the Fukushima Daiichi plant. The Fukushima accident was the single largest release of radioactivity in history. Uh, large amounts of radioactive waste, radioactive water, has entered the marine environment, spread across the Pacific. But Greenpeace is particularly concerned about the impacts on the coastal environment uh, along the coast of Fukushima. Radiological contamination originates from liquid nuclear waste, which leaked immediately following the accident. This includes the enormous amounts of water pumped into the three nuclear reactors to cool hundreds of tons of molten fuel rods. Now radioactive water used to cool the nuclear fuel is stored in huge tanks. It's believed that this contaminated water has been seeping into the groundwater and to some extent the ocean. In addition to collecting samples of marine sediments, Soil and water from within a 20 kilometer radius of the nuclear power plant are also being collected. Preliminary results show that there is more radioactive contamination in rivers than in the ocean. The presence of this contamination in rivers and streams suggests that the likelihood of radioactive substances entering the food chain is very high. Fukushima is a prefecture known for its agricultural and fishing industries. The radioactive contamination of aquatic animals and agricultural crops has had a significant impact, leading people in the area to avoid locally produced food whenever possible. <laughs> Takahashi tells us that he now sources ingredients from Miyagi, Hokkaido, Amori, Akita and Iwate prefectures. Before the earthquake, he used locally sourced ingredients, such as high-quality fish. But now the government has advised against consuming any food from the area. If you want to see more great content from all over the world, please like the video, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. Thank you. A Greenpeace survey of the health of the people in the radioactively contaminated areas has revealed widespread mental health issues. Nearly a third of mothers residing near the nuclear power plant have been reporting feelings of depression. Additionally, thyroid cancer has been detected in children, though details remain incomplete. Radiological contamination has spread throughout land, rivers, streams, forests and mountains in the Fukushima territory. In the no-go zone, we see hundreds of workers clad in radiation protective suits, some operating front loaders in vast fields, while others are cutting grass and removing plants covering the soil. A significant cleanup effort is underway here. This is not, as you might expect, a typical cleaning job. 
due to the pervasive radioactive contamination in the environment. To date, no technology has been developed to entirely eliminate radioactive contaminants from the environment. The current method involves removing the topsoil, where radiation levels are the highest, similar to the method used following the Chernobyl nuclear power plant accident in Ukraine. Radioactive soil, grass and plants were stored in large plastic bags surrounding the power plant. The Japanese government initially stated that the bags would be removed from the area and sent to landfills. But they are still here. It's estimated that there are millions of bags containing radioactive waste around the nuclear plant. But no one is offering a clear answer as to how to manage these massive piles of radioactive soil and other waste. They are still left exposed in open areas, as cities refuse to allocate landfill space for them. In 2015, the Japanese government decided to build interim storage facilities in the cities of Futaba and Okuma to store this dangerous waste. Meanwhile, the government has passed a law requiring the complete removal of these plastic bags from Fukushima Prefecture by 2045. When the Fukushima accident occurred in 2011, the radioactive material released included iodine-131 and cesium-137. Iodine-131, despite having a half-life of only eight days, can become absorbed by food, especially by milk and dairy products. Once ingested, it accumulates in the thyroid gland, inhibiting growth and metabolism and potentially leading to cancer. What poses a significant threat to people in Fukushima, however, is cesium-137. This substance has a chemical composition similar to potassium, tricking the body into absorbing and accumulating it. This accumulation leads to abnormal cell function, ultimately resulting in cancer. Cesium-137 has a half-life of approximately 30 years, meaning it takes roughly 200 years for this substance to decay to just 1% of its initial radioactivity. Scooping up the topsoil is believed to reduce the amount of cesium it contains to some extent. There are, however, some who are striving to go beyond that. Kiyoshige Sugiyuchi, a farmer in Minomisoma, and his friends began cultivating canola, a yellow shrub also known as oilseed rape due to its ability to absorb radioactive cesium. He tells us that when the accident occurred at the nuclear power plant, he considered what he could do. Having experienced the Chernobyl incident in 1986, he rallied the team he'd worked with back then to begin cultivating canola. When absorbed by canola plants, the cesium accumulates in the parts which are not used as food, such as the leaves and stems. Cesium does not, however, accumulate in the seeds from which edible oil is extracted. Growing canola flowers here has a dual benefit. It absorbs cesium from the soil and produces seeds that can be refined into oil for sale or personal consumption. The oil extracted from canola seeds is not radioactive and can be used for cooking. But the leaves and stems still contain radioactive substances. Therefore, they shouldn't be touched. The ability of canola to absorb cesium from the soil is limited, though. It only absorbs a small amount during each crop cycle, so it will take decades to remove the accumulated radioactive materials from the soil here. Despite this, Kiyoshige and his friends remain hopeful, as the amount of land planted with this yellow flower has tripled in the past few years. He also says that this has to be done to provide people with alternative career opportunities. The livelihoods of the people here can no longer rely on employment in the nuclear power plant. Canola isn't the only crop people here have started to grow. 
As we are driving through the area around the nuclear power plant, we notice rice fields beginning to reappear. Some locals mention that the government still restricts cultivation, rice in particular, in certain areas. But many express interest in trying to grow it nonetheless. After harvesting, the rice will be transported to the city's radioactive testing centre to check for levels of contamination that exceed safe consumption limits. Of course, this poses a risk of financial loss because the rice is known as Fukushima rice. Its price may be significantly lower, or it might not be sold at all. People here seem, however, to have little choice but to take this risk. From fields brimming with agricultural products to desolate, toxic land, a once vibrant and tranquil town has transformed into a lonely and deserted place. Since 2011, the Japanese government has invested over 15 billion US dollars in an unprecedented endeavor to mitigate the radioactive contamination around the Fukushima plant. Results from radiation monitoring in the first week after the incident indicate that the amount of radioactive materials has decreased by more than half. A crucial question remains though, has the radioactive fallout reached a safe level for life? Maybe various aspects is connected to the decision of whether you will go back to your original house or will relocate your house. And I think the most, how do I say, the people are concerned is the, of course the, the health impact by radiation. And as I said, there is no safe limit in terms of radiation. So the lower is better, of course. So what we can say is that the, the every people, or everyone should have a right to choose come back to their original house or relocate to have your safe zone. For people in the area, most worrying are the impacts on children who are still developing, as their cells are more sensitive to radioactivity than those of adults. The government's decision to allow people to return before the zone is completely free of radiation is perceived as a tactic to enable them to stop paying evacuation compensation to their citizens and to restart nuclear reactors across the country. The Japanese government basically wants to convince the world that they've recovered from a nuclear disaster less than five years ago. Actually, this is a nuclear crisis that's continuing. There are over 1,000 tanks of highly contaminated nuclear waste on this site. There's radioactive water entering the Pacific Ocean every day. Uh, there's an enormous challenge that will go on for decades, potentially even centuries. So for the Japanese government be, to be trying to restart nuclear power is opposed by the majority of Japanese people and Greenpeace believe that there's no future for nuclear power in Japan. The future is renewables. Since 2023, the Japanese government has gradually lifted the evacuation orders in the exclusion zone surrounding the Fukushima nuclear plant, which had previously been radioactive and hazardous. A report shows, however, that only 1% of the population has returned so far. After the historic disaster, the story of Fukushima may be slowly fading for those at a distance. For some here, though, Fukushima is home and will always be home, despite its desolation and radioactive risks. No one can definitively say whether living and thriving in this place is truly safe. <laughs>